ES Audio. Hello, I'm Nick Curtis, the Evening Standard's Chief Theatre Critic, and welcome back to our new theatre podcast. With me again this week is Nancy Durrant, the Evening Standard's Culture Editor. How are you doing, Nancy? I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. Each week we'll be covering two shows from London stages. Coming up shortly, we're looking at Mary by Rona Munro at Hampstead Theatre. Kicking off, though, is Good, starring David Tennant at the Harold Pinto. Briefly, it is the story of how a man who regards himself as good and who has a Jewish best friend steadily finds himself co-opted by the Nazi party to the point where he becomes a factotum at, at, at Auschwitz. Not just not, not just a factotum, he becomes part of the final solution at Auschwitz. It's written by C.P. Taylor, um, who again was one of those legendary pro- prolific figures who, who then died young and is now largely forgotten apart from good, which is periodically revived. And this production stars David Tennant. It was due to open before the pandemic hit. It was rescheduled several times. Full marks to David Tennant for sticking with it. Full marks to David Tennant for playing a deeply unsympathetic character mm. in a in a play that is a hard ask. I think you like this one more than I did. Yes, I, w- I was taken with it. Good is one of those sort of legendary plays that um, is revived every sort of 20 years. I don't think I saw the last London production which starred Charles Dance. I think I may have seen the one before that years and years ago, but I barely remember it. I think for me... I remember you saying in your review, which was, uh, I think, which was a four-star review, yeah, that, you know, he's, he's this sort of... Yeah, he's this sort of plausible, nice guy who the, the sort of veneer sl- starts to slip slowly. But for me, there's something, I don't know, John Halder, who is the, the name, which is the name of David Tennant's character. He's a, he's a, he's an asshole right from the beginning. I really, I really didn't like him. I just thought, oh, you're one of those bros who thinks he's really, like, he's like a kind of guy who thinks he's a feminist. Do you know what I mean? He's like, yes. he really thinks he's great and that he's a very good man and that he's, the way that he talks, because sometimes he talks kind of to himself, to the audience, and the way that he speaks about his Jewish best friend makes it very clear quite quickly that he's, he likes him despite the fact that he's Jewish. Ah, I didn't and get that not, from it. Interesting. And not necessarily because, you know, and, and, and it's not just not a thing. That's kind of how it started to come across to me quite quickly. Yeah, I suppose maybe that's the, the um, one of the things I liked about it was, mm. again, Tennant, who is, after all, an extremely popular, extremely likable actor, and as far as one can tell, an extremely pleasant, decent mm. man. Every interview I've read with him or seen with him, you know, he, you just think, oh, I wish he was my best friend. <laughs> um, and I thought, so I thought it was, it was in interesting seeing him playing so on, someone yeah. so, so awful. And also, to be honest, um, it's the best performance I've seen him give on stage. Mm. Um, I saw his Hamlet. I saw him do Much Ado About Nothing with Catherine Tate when he was at the height of his Doctor Who star- stardom. I think he's a technically extremely competent stage actor, but I always felt before that I could see him thinking behind the lines. Mm. I didn't enti- ever entirely believe him in this. I felt he was 100% invested in the character. We should probably mention that he shares the stage with two other actors, Elliot Levy and Sharon Small, who play all the other characters. Uh, Levy not only playing his Jewish best friend, but also various high-ranking Nazis and apparatchiks. Uh, Sharon Small playing not only his neglected wife, but his young sort of nubile lover and his mother, um, which... It's a pretty impressive feat on all on all counts. I think. I mean, the the way there, there are no costume changes. There's a very uh, stark set of a sort of concrete bunker. So there's the, the actors have very little to work with beyond their their own technical skill, and I yeah. think it's quite an example of that. I think they're all really good. Sharon Small does brilliantly in uh, in those roles, and it's very. I sort of wonder whether. You know, you're supposed to feel sorry for him having such a tough time at home. But actually, his wife is severely depressed and his mother has dementia. And I I don't know, my sympathy really was sort of with them a bit. I love Elliot Levy. I think Elliot Levy is an incredible actor. And here, I think he's the best thing. He is so good. Just a tilt of the head, a turn of the face, a, a slight shift in the way he holds his shoulders and suddenly he is a different man and you know which man he is because he's been that man before. Yes. Uh, but it's so subtle, but it's so clear. I think he's such a brilliant actor. He I does agree. so brilliantly. But there's a quite a weird thing about the show in that the main character, John Halder, constantly hears music sort of soundtracking his life. It suddenly makes sense right at the very end, yes. which we can't really talk about because it's this kind of incredibly chilling final moment. Yes. But... 
which you can't give away. No. But I, other than that sort of moment of it making sense, I kind of found it really distracting. I thought it was sort of a metaphor. It's the background music to, to what's happening in Germany, mm. isn't it? That uh, a lot of stuff he hears is is sort of uh, German classical composers, Jewish mm. composers, German umpa bands in some cases. Mm. And I think it's a an expression of his denial of what is going on mm. around him and what is going on within him as yeah, well. that's a um, fair way of looking at it, actually. Yeah. Well, I, I quite liked... Uh, going to the theatre and, and being challenged quite a yeah. lot. It's I mean, a hard it is, watch. It is a tough watch. And you know what? I, I, I didn't hate it at all. Mm. And I think as a portrait of the kind of ebbing away of humanity, for him as a kind of example, just of an everyman, uh, and it could be any of us, it is really effective and upsetting. I think for me, his sort of constant assertions to his friends that you know good oh, don't worry you know it's 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 anti-jewish hysteria he calls it and he sort of says you know goodness and decency is obviously going to prevail that to me was super uncomfortable because that is what we tell ourselves yes. you know those yes. of us who think we have nothing to fear yes that is what we say this is mad it can't go on and yet it does you know that really dropped my temperature. And there is a reason why this has been revived, why this revival was planned two years ago mm. uh, and why it still feels current two years on. Mm. Because, there, as you say, Halder has this constant refrain of they're only saying this to get elected, they don't really mean it, this is just populism, it's just sort of stuff, red meat that they're feeding the masses. And I sort of feel we've heard that in quite a few places before. <laughs> and yeah. quite often you find out, actually, no, they do seem to mean it. They, you know, yeah, really, this really... really... Think this. And actually, this is just the tip of the iceberg because Absolutely. they know they won't get elected on the basis of what they actually believe. Yes. And the word, uh, you know, I, I, I don't plan to bandy the word fascism around too easily because I think that is too easily done too yeah. often. But as you say, as an, an ebbing away of decency or a denial of the way populist uh, rhetoric solidifies into into action. I think this is quite a, a timely and important show, really. Yeah, I, I think you, you, you call, wouldn't call you, it enjoyable. No, it's important rather than enjoyable. Can we just have one last word about David Tennant? If we look at the career choices he makes, you know, this man was Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, and, you know, since then he's played a gay serial killer. Mm -hmm. He's about to play Alexander Litvinenko. Yeah. His stage choices have not been simple or straightforward, even... I know Hamlet is a big sort of glitzy role for a, for a, for a stage actor, but it's a it's 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 a challenge, and mm. it's something he did at the absolute height of his uh, his TV stardom. So I think um, free cheers for him, really. Yeah, for, all kudos for him. And for anybody who, really anybody who has that level of TV and film, uh, well, not necessarily film on his part, but TV stardom, mm. the career he has at the moment to take time to come back to the stage, I think, good on him. Yeah, absolutely. Three cheers. Hurrah! Right, let's go to the ads. Coming up in the second half, Mary by Rona Munro at Hampstead Theatre. What did we think of that? Wait and find out. Welcome back. We're discussing Mary at Hampstead Theatre by Rona Munro. Nancy, unpack this one for us. Tell us what this one's about. <laughs> yeah. Basically, I suppose in brief, this is about the struggle in Scotland for political power that was going on around Mary, Queen of Scots. I think that's probably the easiest way to describe it. And yeah. also about um, how she was treated by all of the men surrounding her. Yes. And how her story was portrayed, I think, as well. Mm. It's about it's about different perspectives on a historic story, too, exactly. isn't it? It hinges particularly on how Mary was treated in her third marriage and the perception of that marriage at court. Um, and I felt really quite strongly that this play should have had a trigger warning on it. I think you're right about that. That was actually the the first thing I thought when the lights went down was, oh, is that the end? And the second thing I thought was, well, that would be really difficult if you were a victim of sexual assault. Um, and that's something that's going to come up in this discussion. So if anyone's feeling uncomfortable about that, then by all means, give yourself a break. It's fairly well established now, I think. Um, and anyone who saw uh, Josie Rourke's uh, film, Mary, Queen of Scots, will know this, that Mary's marriage to her third husband was done not out of choice, but because um, he had almost certainly sexually assaulted her and therefore she didn't have any other option but to marry him at that point. And there's a lot of discussion about it in this play. Everything leads up to it. And then and then they say it over and over and over and over again uh, in, the, in, the, in the sort of second half of the whole thing, although it all, it all runs as one. Yeah, I was a bit taken aback, I'm not yes. going to lie. And it's also, it's... it's uh 
curious that a play written and directed by women about one of the most famous women in British and Scottish, particularly Scottish history, is largely expressed as a discussion between two men by Mary's courtier and um, supporter, James Melville, who's played by Douglas Henshaw from TV's Shetland, Mm -hmm. um, although he's also a very well-established stage actor, and by a sort of servant character who becomes the master over Melville. The third person on stage, or the third major character on stage, because there are some minor cameo roles, is a woman who is constantly silenced and shushed by the men, or talked over, or told that she's wrong, or that she's got things Mm. wrong. I just found this really strange. I had this discussion with a friend afterwards and he was saying, well, you know, isn't that kind of the point? Uh, The fact is this is history gets told and we see the way that history gets retold right at the end when Melville is trying to work out how to say something and you see him figuring out how to gently massage the truth so that in fact what happens to to, to Mary, which is genuinely horrific, uh, is simply kind of excised from the discussion. Mm. It, it's obviously deliberate. I mean, Rona Monroe is a brilliant playwright. It's not like she didn't realise this. Do you know what I mean? But yes. I, but I, I'm not sure it landed I agree. entirely. Yeah. So that that for me was a little bit of an issue. Yes. But anyway, it's possibly it might be worth putting it into the context. It's effectively the sixth part of a trilogy. Uh, Rona Monroe wrote the James plays mm-hmm. as a sort of um, cheeky, but I think necessary riposte to the fact that most of our um, understanding of Tudor and Stuart history comes from Shakespeare's history plays. So we know all about the Henrys, we know nothing about the Jameses. So she wrote a terrific trilogy that was... they were superb. uh, They were superb plays. And it may also be worth uh, mentioning that the the first play was very much a vehicle for Sophie Grabol, the um, Mm. Danish star of The Killing, who played Queen Margaret of Denmark and was the sort of kingmaker of the Jameses in in those plays. So then there are two other James plays which haven't been seen in London yet. One is going on in Scotland, one hasn't been staged. Mary is therefore the one that follows that unstaged see, play. Okay. Maybe the arc of the whole thing makes a lot more sense than this does standing alone. Mm. It is designed as a standalone play as well, but maybe it would land differently if one had seen all other five parts. But yeah. that's quite a big ask well, of any theatre It's a big really. ask of anyone, really, isn't it? And I do think, you know, it, I feel bad that I don't like this more yeah. because, you know, for me, this is a very laudable aim to shed light on the fact that sexual violence has been used as a weapon for power by men mostly for centuries and not just in other places as well, you know, places yes. where we think it's, you know, a thing that happens uh, and not here. It has happened here more than once. Uh, and also to highlight the woman's side of a woman's story that is well known but never seen. Hmm. You know, I, I am massively behind all of those um, things. I just, for me, just as a play, let's just talk about it as a, you know, the thing yes. that we saw that night. I just felt it was a bit flat. It's, it's bit very, flat very repetitive. It's, it's, it's the same argument rehashed over and over and over again with slightly nuanced changes of wording or, mm. or skewing or sense. But it is quite flat and it is basically just two blokes shouting at each other in a room. It um, should have been super tense. Yes, you know, you should yes. have been kind of like, oh, back and forth, tennis. You know, this is really, uh, you know, I think you don't quite understand the, the stakes until a bit further in than perhaps you need to. I felt almost in a way, even though it's not a very big theatre that happened, if it had been in a smaller space, it would have felt more tense. You would have been, you know, if you were closer to the actors and they were kind of prowling around each other, but actually most of the time they were in a line in front of you. Yes. And it just felt very isolated within the space of that theatre. So it did not very dynamic. They're not very physical, the performances no. either, are Well, it's they? all, you know, and that's, that's, that's them, that's the direction, that's the, the, the shape yeah. of the stage, whatever it is. It, it doesn't lend itself to dynamism. It's very talky. Yes. But if it had been in the round, for example, and you had them kind of prowling around each other, it just would have been a bit more yes, obvious. Yes. I have to say, D- Douglas Henshaw, I've, I've been watching him for almost three decades now. I remember him, him playing a very terse character at the Bush years ago, decades ago, um, and thinking then, gosh, he's a very contained, sort of internalised actor. Mm. I don't feel he's that generous on stage. And I, I, I wondered if that was part of it. I mean, he's very obviously the lead in this, mm. isn't he? Yeah, um, he's the lead and he's also the Lord. You know, he's yes. the one who isn't a servant in yes. theory. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I didn't think that Rona Morrison, who I think is really good, had quite enough to work with. Actually, I thought she did her absolute best with that role, but I don't think it was quite good enough for her. Mm. But I also, but I did think that Brian Vernell, who um, some listeners will know from uh, Gangs of London, was superb. I thought he was brilliant. His sort of 
flipping between a kind of slightly frightened boy to arsy little shitbag to um, to suddenly, you know, the man who who knows he's got someone in his power, but he's not really the one with the power because, you know, he has bosses and they're the ones who have given him the space. But, you know, his his ability to flip between those those emotions and those positions, sometimes within two sentences, I think is really exceptional. He's, it's, he's yes. bloody chilling. Yes, actually. the shift, the shifting of the of the power balances between them should have been more compelling, I think, really, as well, because suddenly you have Melville going from the man who has all the power in the room to having none of the power in the room. Yeah. And Vanell, even uh, when his character is ostensibly in charge, he's still sort of looking for approval from the Lord, yeah. I think, which is... Interesting. It's also, um, I think we should say, it's it's written interestingly in that the it's a sort of hybrid idiom between what Scots of that era might have sounded like and some contemporary stuff, which I think works really well. I yeah. think the dialogue was great. So there's lots of things that should have worked, that should have made this play terrific, and it just wasn't. Yeah. You know, sometimes know plays it... just go wrong. Sometimes they sometimes don't, they just don't work. Yeah, exactly. They it just sort of sat there in the room rather than becoming something in the room. Yes. And I didn't, yeah, I felt a bit flat yes. afterwards. Yes. It wasn't a struggle to watch at all, but it just didn't it just didn't land for me. No, me neither. This has been the Evening Standards Theatre Podcast. I'm Nick Curtis. Thank you for joining me, Nancy Durham. You're very welcome. Thank you. You can find us online at standard.co.uk forward slash culture or hashtag The Leader Podcast on Twitter. The Leader Podcast will be back tomorrow from 4pm and we'll see you again next Sunday for a brand new episode covering London's theatre. Thanks for listening.